introduce Helene Knapp, CEO of City Row, uh, who's going to be presenting on making waves, what it really takes to build a company and be a leader from startup to series A. Helene, thanks for being here with us today. I'm super excited uh, to talk with you and to see what you've brought for us today. Awesome. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to let step out of the way and let you get started. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone, for being here. I'm, uh, I'm excited to share a little bit more about the City Row journey and really what it takes. You know, I think to preface this, there's a lot of romance around entrepreneurship, right? Everyone start a company, be their own boss. And I constantly always say it's not always rainbows and butterflies. It takes a lot of work. You know, you should still, the theme here is jump in, but the water is really cold. So I'm going to take a step back and tell you a little bit about my founding journey. And as I reflect on that, plus the journey that we've taken through the inception, through our series A, which we're at right now, what the key themes are, what, what does it really take, right? Sure. Everyone has great ideas. Very few people execute on that and even, even fewer get to that next level. So a little bit about me. Grew up in New York, went to Michigan, came back, started working in magazines because that's where my mom's best friend worked and that's how things work. And quickly realized, hey, this is a pretty archaic business and they're not looking to innovate. And turned out I wanted to innovate and I love technology. So I found my way to some tech startups. And for those of you in tech, it's a high, like high energy, fast paced, unbelievably exciting, total roller coaster of a company. I, I learned early on that those early startups and part of the reason that they're so fun is that you get to ride this wave of the highs of highs and the lows of lows. And as the company becomes more mature, those highs become a little less exciting, right? Oh, we got a great press release here. We were featured here. We got this big new client. Over time, they become a little bit more muted. And then this is Microsoft, right? So I was really enjoying the, the riding those waves and being a part of a growth story. Uh, my first tech company was a company called Buddy Media. Um, think about the time it was 2010. And all of a sudden we went from a world where Facebook and social media, but really Facebook was the priority at this point, was all, all about people. It was only for individuals. If you were, if you were, you know, if you were playing at that point, it started as just people in college and then started to expand and my grandma could join. And then all of a sudden brands could be on social media, which if you think about the ecosystem of building a brand, historically, it would take them many years to figure out what their one line was going to be in the new ad campaign. And social media totally blew that up. Overnight, brands had to not just be a part of a conversation and quickly respond to a customer service and whatnot, but they had to start conversations and have a personality. So setting the stage, this is a really, really, really interesting time to be in a social media SaaS software company. Um, so I had a great time there with client services, account, the whole thing. We sold that company to salesforce.com, which was an unbelievable exit. But as a little, you know, 23 year old running enterprise accounts, all of a sudden I wasn't. Uh, so I lasted about six days there. Uh, unbelievable company wasn't for me at the time and went to another tech company through that also in the social media marketing space, really with an emphasis on how to leverage the power of user generated content to drive conversion on websites. Really cool company also had a great exit, um, had a lot of fun building that one really from the ground up, but really on a personal note, as I started working for these high growth and fast paced tech companies, I had after college gone on a bit of a, a wellness journey myself. So college was unbelievably fun. I went to Michigan. I wouldn't say I was totally healthy at college. I would say it was more of a like a nacho situation versus where's the gym. And so after college, I'm working in this high fashion magazine and I'm like, I've got a nine to five. So I've got plenty of time in the day to figure out how I'm going to work out, how I'm going to cook a healthy dinner. So I dropped about 30 pounds, was feeling really good about myself. And then in I walked to this fast paced, super exciting, high growth tech company where there was endless amounts of opportunities, not just to close the next deal, get the next client, get an upsell over here, but it's also really fun and exciting, right? Everyone was at the office until sometimes eight, nine, 10 o'clock at night. There was a beer fridge, which I don't know if that's still cool anymore, but it was a very big deal at our tech company. There were happy hours, there were team events. And so all of a sudden I was never getting to the gym after work. 
And it was about this time that boutique fitness entered my life. And if you kind of look back to the ecosystem at that point, it was really the times where the big box gyms were thriving. And by that, I mean the, the 24 hour fitnesses the New York sports clubs, the Equinox and boutique fitness was very, very, very early stage. And it was actually the true boutiques that were really playing well in 2010, 2011. So it was just soul cycle. It was just physique. It was just pure bar. And there really wasn't enough supply to meet the demand. And so if you were lucky enough to be able to bring clients and, you know, be ready at Monday at 12 PM to book your classes, you were able to be part of this really, you know, boutique experience. And for me as a consumer, when I signed up for it, I was held accountable. And more importantly, if I signed up with my friends, even better. So here I am loving a boutique fitness life. It's a huge, huge, huge part of my social life as well. I go with my clients, I go with my friends. And um, after a couple of years of doing this, I'm moving on to my next tech company. I start to not feel so great in my lower back. And uh, after finally going to the doctor, I find out that I have three herniated discs. I was 25 years old and really pissed off because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm doing everything right. I'm working out five days a week, right? I'm checking all these boxes. How am I possibly injured? I should be able to run a Spartan race in my sleep, especially with how much money I'm spending on these things. So that frustration and being really sidelined from this thing that I loved forced me to kind of confront that here I was thinking I was doing everything right and moving my body, which I thought that was good for you. But not all movement was created equal. And it really forced me to look at the industry and look at the products and realize that there weren't a lot of things that out there that were gonna actually deliver results for me, right? I like to torch calories and really tone my body and be strong that were also gonna be smart for my body and low impact. That was, the, that was the buzzword that my doctor told me that I needed that I couldn't find anywhere. And in talking to people, I quickly learned that, all right, Helene, you can start swimming. Well, let me tell you, I'm not interested in swimming for a couple of reasons. One, I live in New York City. Two, my hair does not look like this when I get out of the water. So for me, swimming was not an option. The other low impact, total body burn, cross-country skiing, super not accessible. I'm like, all right, what else? My trainer's like, you know, you should really try rowing. It torches calories. It works 85% of your muscles in every stroke. And it's this total impact thing that you need. And as I started talking to friends, everyone needs this. And I was like, that's disgusting, Carter. I'm never going to row. You have to understand where I'm coming from on this because I've never rowed a day in my life. My grandpa tried to get me a row in college, but it involves some kind of 4.30 a.m. wake up. And that's not why I went to college. I went, I went to go to bed at 4.30, not wake up at 4.30. So that compiled with the fact that the only image I had in my mind was a Winklevoss twin or all my guy friends who did CrossFit and who rode for like two minutes and then lift something really heavy. So to me, I was like, no way. But I'm sitting there, I'm sidelined. I'm really frustrated. I'm realizing all my friends are injured too. And we're in our 20s. I watched my mom have a double, double knee replacement. I watched friends have like rotator cuff surgery. Everyone's got a torn meniscus in my life. I'm like, what are we doing? We have one body. Isn't there a better way? And I was like, you know, this rowing thing was still in my mind. I could not stop thinking about it because I thought to myself, I think that there is a way to create something that's actually going to deliver results today, but also keep our bodies safe for life. And I'm looking at the trends and I'm realizing, you know, people are working out not just more days of the week as more people are coming into this ecosystem, but we're starting younger and we're not stopping, right? We're not stopping working out when we hit our forties or fifties or sixties. I got an 85 year old grandma that does Pilates three times a week. I don't know what she's doing, but she's wearing a cute outfit. And I think mentally it's really great for her. So Thinking about that, we have to be a little bit smarter about the movement. And so I'm like, you know what? I think this rowing thing has legs, but I know that it has an image problem. If I can bring it mainstream, make it accessible and cool, I think we're really on to the next frontier of smart movement. So as I'm sitting there, I just started my second tech company. I was like, let's just see if it could work. So I go to a serial entrepreneur friend of mine and I say, hey, Dan, I got this idea. He's like, yeah, yeah. 
This guy sold four companies. Like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let's do, let's do a pop-up next weekend. Do the next soul cycle. And I was like, well, thank you so much for your support. Um, I have no idea how to launch this company and I currently can't teach classes. So um, let's figure out how else to assess demand. Okay, fantastic. We start building a website and we're like, okay, if we get 300 signups, we'll pull the trigger on this thing. I asked some friends for a favor. We built a website, coming here, sign up for the next big thing. We got close to 1,500 signups before we even decided to sign a lease. And that was through true word of mouth, organic press. And I was like, holy shit, now I have to figure this thing out. Now I have to actually build the company. I have no idea how to do that. Also, I have a full-time job. It's pretty busy. But a piece of advice that came to me really early on from that same friend of mine was it's one decision at a time. One decision at a time doesn't mean doesn't matter how little it is, doesn't matter how big it is, just keep making decisions to move the company forward. And that's been a mantra that I have lived by since that very day. And so, so throughout that year of 2013, I started making little decisions, get an operating agreement, open a bank account, start to find real estate, try and find people that have ever rode before in their whole life that could be a partner in this. So little decisions throughout the year, the full side hustle, you know, people always ask me, when was the moment you decided to start the company? And the reality is, is that it just kind of happened. And I just kind of kept making decisions to move the company forward. And then all of a sudden we're sitting there and it's the end of the summer, 2013. I've been looking for real estate. Nobody wants to be real estate because one, I have no money. Two, I have no company and we're a gym. So we're kind of loud. And I'm at the end of my rope and I'm about to give up. Because, hey, if I can't find a space, then I can't launch this thing. And the real jump-in moment was when I decided to sign a lease. And a lot of factors went into actually being able to get a landlord to say yes to us. It included having to, I don't know, show some fake numbers in a bank account. Maybe my mom had to wire some money in just for a quick screenshot and wire it back. Um, I had to agree to some crazy terms from a nasty landlord all part of the startup process. You do things that you don't even know that you have to do in order to move the company forward. Um, Since then, we opened our doors for our first retail location in January, 2014. I quit my job that same day. I had back surgery eight days later and we continued to build the business. You know, we really had no idea what we were getting ourselves into in the very beginning, but I remember thinking to myself, I don't know if this rowing thing is going to work, but I very much believe in myself that I can figure this thing out. Worst case scenario, we turn into a yoga studio or maybe this new co-working space. We could have been the next we work if this thing didn't work. So I went in all in realizing that now was the time to do it. If not now, never. I'm super young. Let's try and figure it out. And it's been a crazy adventure of one decision at a time ever since. And we opened a couple more locations in New York City made all of the mistakes in the world at every juncture because that's how you learn. We decided to go big on a digital activation back in 2016. So we met really early. We brought in some partners. Some were good, some weren't. We decided to franchise as well, brought in some more partners. Again, some were good, some were not. Negotiated all kinds of crazy deals to get this done. Try Try to raise capital, failed. Try to raise capital, failed. Multiple times throughout it, kept scrapping, scrapping things together. And then we launched our digital at-home rower back in 2018, just launched our new rower this past fall. And so today where we sit, we have 25 people that work at City Row and we're a true omni-channel fitness brand with an emphasis on smart movement and smart fitness. So we have 65 franchises nationwide. 11 of those are open. We have two rowers that we sell, our interactive rower that has a beautiful 19 inch tablet and hundreds of on-demand classes. And the beauty is that we really are focusing on the end consumer. We wanna meet the customer where they are. I don't care where you are on your fitness journey, we're gonna meet you there. I don't care if you wanna work out at home or in a studio or both we're going to meet you there. And then we're going to let you dabble in the other ones as well. So we really are redefining what true omni-channel means for a fitness brand. And I think it's all about the clients and understanding their stories. But, you know, to take a little bit of a step back in realizing what it took to get here, we're talking about seven and a half years into this journey. And we are just now closing our series A. It takes a lot. It takes a lot of grit. But we talk about grit all day long. You really need grit and a lot of resilience to get through this thing. But tactically, 
I think you have to know not quite enough to jump in, right? Had I known when I was about to sign that first lease that we would experience four floods in three months or that the AC unit really didn't work or that the soundproofing the tenant before had done really wasn't gonna work and we were gonna have some problems or a slew of the employment issues that you, you deal with when you have hourly employees. I'm used to running a tech company. I knew how to hire for like an account manager. I had no idea where to find a $12 an hour employee. I wouldn't have jumped in had I known everything. So you have to know enough. I always say, and I think this is a Jeff Bezos quote, like make decisions with 80% of the information. When you have 100%, it's way too far. And that's been a theme throughout, you know, when we decided to franchise, I did my research, I did my homework, but at some point you are never going to get all of your questions answered and you have to jump in if you want to be an innovator and a mover. It's one of the number one rules of entrepreneurship is you've got to move quickly and then you continue to rebuild around you as needed. A theme that is, you know, I'm not the first person to say this and I won't be the last, really all comes down to the team and people around you. And I think one of, one of the things that I learned very on, and I'm lucky to be a very, very self-aware person, is that I knew that I needed to surround myself with people that had very complementary skill sets to me. And that those skill sets have changed and evolved since the very beginning. The first person I needed more than anything was a fitness professional, right? I could not run this thing without someone that was going to teach these classes and deliver this program and help me refine the program. I brought on board a woman named Annie Mulgrew, who uh, I'd actually met studying abroad years ago. We lost touch. And as I was about to give up on finding someone to help me with this, I saw her trending on a website. She's still with me seven and a half years later. That evolved into bringing on my co-founder who really wears the branding, communication and marketing hat. And then throughout the years as we grew, we needed like a finance, business, lawyer type. And I brought on this guy named Jeff. I joke all the time, he's my guy in a blazer right? I'm a young female entrepreneur. Sometimes I need a guy in a blazer. Like I need a guy in a blazer sidekick and joke about that a lot. I've actually needed a couple of guy in a blazer sidekicks over the years just to, you know, help out with some things. So I would say that has been a theme throughout. And as we continue to evolve and grow, I still need more and more people to fill the right holes with the right skill sets. Um, another theme that's come out, I would say since day one is you have to constantly be making deals right? This is all about partnership and growth. Whether you're making a deal with a new guy in a blazer or you're making a deal with a landlord or a partner or a franchisee, you have to constantly be understanding what the people on the quote unquote other side of the table want and need, right? And they, sometimes they don't even know. And I would say the secret sauce to that is just to continue to ask discovery questions nonstop. What is their true motivator? I have a, a manufacturing partner that does not have quite the exact motivation that you would think. It's not very traditional, right? They're not necessarily motivated by money, which is which was, took me about three to four years to figure this out. And once we did, it was a total game changer. And so in all of these deal makings and learned throughout the years, really understanding the true why behind someone partnering is the only way to get a partnership deal done that is going to be a win-win for the long term. Second to that, I've learned to always bake in a one year to two year renegotiation of all partnerships forces you to come to the table and talk through things that might not be working. And no one likes confrontation. So unless you have a forced reason to have conversations, most people, because we don't like conflict, who does, is really going to avoid those. Tons of things to talk about, but what it really takes to start a company, but it all comes back to the leadership. And in my case, in our case, it comes down to me. Anyone who I talk to who's considering starting a company, I always say, like I said, when I started out this, this conversation, jump in, but the water is really cold. Know what you're getting yourself into. And more importantly, know yourself. You have to have a really, really, really good sense of who you are, what you're good at, not be afraid of saying what you're not good at, the only way you're going to grow, the only way you're going to build is to actually admit where you need help. And then to have the confidence to weather the storm. We talked about this, right? Highs of highs, lows of lows. That is going to happen sometimes in the same day. You have to be prepared. And by prepared, I mean, build the right 
people around you, build the right level of confidence around you to be able to weather the storms. The foundation will be tested at many points. It will never stop being tested. And the stronger your foundation, which is a combination of your personal confidence, people that you've built around you, and your understanding of your skill sets and those around you is what's going to help you weather the entire the entire intense roller coaster. So I always say, and I'll say it again, jump in, but it is cold and it is not rainbows and butterflies. You can do it, but go in eyes wide open and know you might need a couple jackets too. So thank you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Helene. Uh, some really great advice for startups, entrepreneurs. It's uh, definitely cold waters to swim in, but it's fun. It's cold. <laughs> it's, it's fun. You can do it. Yeah. You've totally remade me evaluate rowing, though. I remember in college, I did that for a while and because it was the machine that was open. So not anymore. Yep. Not anymore. So really appreciate you being with us today, Elaine. Uh, keep up the good work. Really excited to follow what's next for City Row. You guys have a lot of cool things going on. Um, kind of got me diving a little deep doing research for the conference. And so excited about what you guys have in the future. So we appreciate your time today being with Leading Entrepreneurs today and uh, look forward to following your progress. Thanks a lot, Jonathan. Yep, happy to connect with anyone through any of our studios, our at-home rowers, our subscription, uh, or find me on LinkedIn. But thanks a lot for having me. Awesome. Appreciate it and best of luck in the future. Thank you.